Hello and welcome to the International Schools Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Taylor, and on the podcast, we discuss all aspects of technology and life in international schools, with new episodes live every two weeks. We focus on people who are currently working in schools, and we talk about life in their current country and dive into some specific topics. The podcast is brought to you by Acer for Education. People always ask what Chromebooks we recommend and what Windows laptops we recommend, and after trying literally all of them, we always recommend Acer. If you'd like to get more info and try out some devices, please just go to gg.gg forward slash Acer Education. That's gg.gg forward slash Acer Education, and we'll get right back to you. Also, the podcast is brought to you by Apps Events. We're a Google partner. We work all around the world. We've just got one piece of new information right now. This is in in January 2021. We're a G Suite Enterprise for Education partner. That's Giuseppe. This is a bunch of premium tools available to people using Google at their schools. We can help you get set up with a free one-month trial. So please check out the link in the show notes, and we'll do that right away. And now, on to the interview. Hi, and welcome to the International Schools Podcast. I'm joined, as usual, by John Mixon, my co-host. How are you doing, John? Great. It was really nice catching up together face-to-face. It's been a long time. I got to uh, come out to Prague, and Dan and yep. I got to have lunch together, and that was really nice. Uh, I was visiting my son, who works in Prague. So that had been, I think, been over two or three years. So we always see each other on the podcast, so it's nice. Oh, yeah, it was, it was great. We, we drove out. This was two days ago, so I'm in Prague. Obviously, John's in Luxembourg, and John was in Prague. We went out for lunch outside Prague, which was cool. I had a drive out to Bron. Nice little town and uh, a burger, which was cool. So, um, yeah, it was good to see you, John. And uh, we, should have, we should do a podcast next time we're in person. We should actually record one in person. We should. We should. That was a mistake. Anyway, we're here and excited to uh, hear from Declan. Yeah, Declan Burke uh, on the podcast today. Welcome, Declan. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I've known Declan for quite a while. We've, we've met in Hong Kong on at least three, two or three occasions, I think. Um, so uh, Declan's a tech director. And what's interesting is Declan is at a school called uh, Tanganyika International School in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. And John Mickton used to do Declan's job. How many years ago, John? In 1993. 93, right. How many is that? Almost 93 almost... to 96. Actually, at that time, we did not have an IT director. It was split between two. I was in charge of the kindergarten, which had a campus downtown and the lower school, the elementary school, and then uh, Jake, JJ, uh, Jacob Johnson, who is now the IT director, Carol Morgan in the Dominican Republic was in charge of the upper school and middle school. Cool, we well, I, want to, I want to get into that and compare the two. It's, but first of all, Declan, let's just talk a bit about, you know, what's, what's your background? Because it's interesting for me, because we've hung out a lot, but I don't really know, uh, you know, what your background is. And, you know, I know you did some, some other stuff before you got into education. So, so how, what did you start off doing after, you know, after yeah, you started? So after I, I got, I'm, I'm from Ireland. So I uh, graduated with a degree in computer science and most of my work in the, for, in the early years was in finance. So I worked for a lot of insurance companies. I was programming, writing insurance rating engines. And right. there's nothing better to stop a conversation dead than to tell people you write rating engines for insurance companies. So yeah. not, not, a, not the most exciting part of my career. But then from there, um, I think we did like Y2K, we did the Euro conversions, all of those big projects that were happening at that time. And then I decided to take some time off and um, started traveling. And then during my travel, stopped in South Korea to do some, uh, got into some education, then decided to just get qualified in it while I was in it and continue to to get qualified, more and more qualified. And uh, that's where I started off. Uh, Eventually went on to Hong Kong, did 15 years in a couple of different schools in Hong Kong. And then before coming over here to IST in Tanzania to take over from John, (laughs) albeit with a gap. With a slight gap, yeah. I I was, and so I just want to jump back. There's a few interesting things you said. Let's go into that. Like, so when you said get qualified, like, what did you do? Like, what, what, what you thought? So, were you traveling with your wife? When, or did you meet her in Korea? Were you already, were you already going around? Yeah, I met my wife in Korea, but my first qualification was like a PGCE, which is an old money for then it was, then I did the PGDE, and now I've done the masters. So, I've sort of progressed through the ranks. 
And did to, you do them on online or did you actually take them in, yeah. in Korea? Uh, no, the, the PGDE I did in Hong Kong University. Okay. So Declan, were you working in an education institution and then as you were working, you're like, wow, I need to get these qualifications or were you trying to get into a school? Yeah, so in Hong Kong, sorry, in, um, in Korea, when we were working there, we were mostly working for language centers. So that's when I, yeah. I did two years there and that's when I got qualified during that period of time. Are you were teaching, were you teaching right. English there? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Teaching Irish, teaching how to speak Irish, I guess. Giving them an accent that would open doors <laughs> for them worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, that's in great. Story, and and that's the thing I think that's so funny in these language schools, you have people from different Anglo Anglophone countries. So British, American, and often the students end up with the accent of their teacher, which is lovely. Yeah, yeah I spent I spent my first year in 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 Seoul with a, a group of kids and they gave me like all the boys they wanted all the boys in the in the kindergarten class to have a male teacher so i, I taught them and sure enough by the end of the year they had a so let's say a, a bit of a twang and yeah. as i was leaving at the end of that year the parents said to me like is there any way you'd stay or you know because i was moving into a a, a school more in the city center because i was playing a lot of sport at that time like gaelic football and soccer and things like that and they asked me would I would I stay for one more year to help the kids because the kids had really got sort of attached to me and, and we had a good relationship. And then they also said, look, we're a little bit worried. They do have a bit of an accent, you know, similar to yours. And I said, look, they're all boys. When they grow up, an Irish accent will get them anywhere. Not a bother. I said, if anything you want to find, keep it up. <laughs> yeah. That's I cool. they did know. And how so how did you um so was it like you were teaching English and then you've, you've, you'd heard about the, you heard about the international school world and you wanted to get a job. Is, is that how it happened or how, how did you end up? How did it come about getting a job? A couple of people I knew, especially guys on the, on my football team, um, were working in the Seoul farm school. Yeah. So you, very well. yeah, you got to, you got talking to people on the international circuit and you understood, hold on, there's a outside of language centers, there's a proper profession here and sort of could keep you going in your, in, in traveling and, um, and, you know, they had resources, technology departments, all those sort of things. So for me, it was a, it was a bit of an eye opener rather than going back into writing insurance rating engines. I could actually, you know, be more uh, front facing with, with humans rather than computers all of the time. And that, and that I, I used to miss that um, in my in my career during large projects. I would actually go contracting and work for myself and take on projects that would require six months of coding. So you're basically in a cave for six months, not talking to anyone. And then you come out, you deliver your project and then you get time off. But it's not a very social endeavor to lock yourself away and code solidly for six months. Uh, and I, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more of a people person than that. At least I, I like to think I am. Well, being an educator is wonderful, surrounded by kids and staff, and, and that, that's a great environment to be interacting with. When you uh, decided to start going into international schools, what was maybe something coming from the business world and not being an educator? What were some things that surprised you that maybe were a learning curve for you, you know, a different type of uh, disposition about work? Um, yeah, the hours was was one thing like people complaining that there was a, a workshop being held at 4 p.m i'm like what what's wrong with 4 p.m <laughs> you know like uh, you set a meeting at friday at four or five o'clock and they're like there's nobody going to turn up to that one and so that that took a little bit of um you know getting your head around that yeah i i think after the timetable is done getting getting teachers to stay back can be can be difficult, let's say. Um, whereas in, in the business world, there is no timetable. There is no late meeting. It's just a meeting. It's whenever it's set, you're there. End of you know, story. And you know what I've seen is I've seen people, I mean, John's a great example of this. People who do have that work ethic do really well in international schools who have that kind of, you know, especially in the technology roles. I've, I've seen that time and time again. Mm. Well, what was yeah, your first point? I think Dan, that's a good point, but I think uh, for many, and Declan, jump in, for many tech directors, uh, it is kind of all encompassing because usually when everybody leaves, that's when you get to actually do your work. Uh, or when people are on holiday, that's when you can do a lot of updates and things like that. So I think that work ethic that you're describing that you came from, Declan, definitely serves you well. 
Mm. And I find kind of that so I've been involved in a lot of campus renovations and and sort of uh, new builds over the last number of years, and that always the cutting edge of that happens a minute before the opening of school, right? I, I don't care who plans the project, how early they plan for it to finish, it happens the night before the school opens the next day. Inevitably, yeah. that's what happens. And uh, being on the ground, yeah, I don't know how many summers I've, I, I'm not gonna say I wasted, but uh, summers that I lost because of campus renovations, uh, you know, huge overhauls, installing a new, school information system or a new program or a new network yeah you're you're always working or, or keeping an eye on what's going on and, and this summer has been another example of that here what have you been doing here this summer intensely um, so we were doing a, a large network overhaul and there are a couple of different um what have we got? We've got the sports center opening. We've got housing, which has been uh, renovated. Um, there's a number of different projects here, but our big one is the network overhaul. But what's actually going to delay us even further is because of COVID, the supply lines have not, not, not dried up, but have really, really been slow. So orders that we placed in January, we still don't have them here in, in Tanzania yet. And that's been a very, very difficult thing to work around. Declan, that's interesting that you mentioned that because we put a big order in January for laptops and we won't get them till November. So I don't think it's, I think it's a global pinch point is the supply chains uh, because of COVID. And I don't know what specifically, but we work with Lenovo and a supplier here and they've said it's just been really difficult. And I think part of it, correct me if I'm wrong, is the chips, that there are a lot of issues with chip manufacturers. Yeah. And uh, and so that kind of has a domino effect. So yeah, that's hard, especially when you're doing something at large scale like you are there, Declan. Mm. Yeah, our big one has been working with Cisco. So Cisco USA, um, again, we got to be realistic. We think we've spent a whole pile of money and we should demand some sort of, you know, uh, premium service. But our budget compared to, you know, a state in the US who has overhauled their network as well, or some of these large yeah. companies we're, we're we're nothing really. But for us, it's a very, very big spend. It's a once in a 10 year spend. But for them, you know, in the general scheme of things, I think we're, we're small fry. Definitely. Declan, I want to just, it'd be just great to fly through your career and we'll get into Tanzania. next. I'm really interested, like what, 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 what did you, what was the first job? Did you get in a, when you went to for, to an international school from the language center, were you were you a teacher or did you get a tech role? Uh, a bit of both. So I, I I came in as a as a teacher, like I came in as an elementary school teacher, yeah. and within minutes you were sort of helping with the tech or yeah. they were basically this is still this is wow, I don't know how many years ago now, um, 15, 16, 17 years ago. So yeah. you you know tech departments back then weren't exactly, they weren't tech departments. I mean, even so my university, the, the IT department was part of the math department, right? It wasn't a department on its own. And yeah, actually yeah. when I started in my first international school, it was the same thing. Whoever was head of math was also head of IT. It was just wow. sort of an add on thing. And it was only when I joined with obviously my certain level of expertise that they said, right, I think we can actually set up an IT department, have a specified IT subject, and then give it on to me. So very, very quickly, I, I took on that role, obviously willingly, I, and I was delighted to do it, and then to bring my expertise and my skill set into the classroom and to help other teachers. And was your first job in South Korea or, or in Hong Kong? That one was in, um, in, uh, in Hong Kong. Okay, cool. So, so you decided to make a move. Did you figure out that Hong Kong was just like a more a bigger market for international schools or did you just want to go there for the lifestyle? What was the reason you, you, you went there? Yeah, it, actually, it, it was a couple of things. I had some friends who'd moved over. Um, we were big playing, playing a lot of Gaelic football back then, actually. So we just won the Asian games, as it were, it, the Asian Gaelic games, which was, which was great fun, a great festival that was ha held every year in a different city. And then the guys from Hong Kong had actually called um, a couple of us and said, you know, if you want to come over, uh, come on over to Hong Kong. Um, so I, I was at a loose end. I was literally at that crossroads where do I go back into uh, 
finance or do I go, you know, full steam ahead into education? And even when I landed in Hong Kong, uh, I interviewed for one or two banks. Right. And I was sort of like, wow, which way do I go here? You know, like, um, and, so and what it was, was it that pushed you into education? You know, so you're at this crossroads. You have now had a taste of both. What were maybe some of the things that were you were, you know, in your list? Kind of why did you go with education? Yeah, I, imagine, I imagine the money was better in banking than education. Yeah, but it's job <laughs> satisfaction. I've actually yeah, had yeah. this. I've had this discussion on, with a, no, a number of friends who who are working in banking and finance, and it's you know like at, at the on, on the end of a wet Wednesday a horrible day and my last class I've, I've taught a kid who you know who just something clicked you've you've made a connection you've just seen their eyes open up and they've come to you at the end of class going hey mr burke thank you you know you've just made something that has been stuck in my mind for months or years or i've been struggling with it works i've got it you've just explained it thank you very much you know you pack your bag you're going out and you're sitting in your car with your hands on the steering wheel going Geez, I feel good. I, I feel great. I'm, well, I'm driving home with the music turned up and I've got a smile on my face. And I've said this to, the, to guys who I know who work in banking and they're saying, why did you, why, what are you doing in education? And I tell them this story and I said, how many times has that happened to you when you walk out of your bank? And they just shake their head and go, yeah, I hate my job. I hate the people I work for. You know? so so what was your focus? Is, is that so when you were deciding between two, did you think, well, I'm probably going to enjoy this job more than banking? Was that how was that kind of what swung it for you then? Yeah, partially. I, again, like I didn't want to go back to being a, a, a tiny cog in a huge wheel in a back basement where I'm coding or doing something for, yeah. you know, I mean, what's the what's the vision and mission of a bank it's to make more money for rich exactly. people? You yeah. know, and, <laughs> what's your end goal here? Uh, and where is it going to end up? Um, so, I mean, I, I suppose it was a bit of an, uh, an idealist move. But, um, yeah, I, look, when I look back at it now, you know, you've been in education for, for almost 20 years. I, I don't regret it. Um, I'm living here in, in, in a beautiful country. Uh, I've got three kids who are in great schools. Uh, yeah. We travel around a lot. We, you know, our lifestyle is fantastic. And I'm not going to, you know, drop dead at the age of 50 because of stress. Um, yeah, so yeah. There are there are more things in life than money, despite what That's everyone true. might tell you. We, we've actually got some similarities in that career, which I, I didn't realize. That. My, I used to work in IT in banking. I worked for an investment bank on, on a graduate training scheme after university, and, and then I went to Deloitte, and then, then I became a freelancer like you. So I was a consultant for a long time, and then I discovered education, and I just loved working with schools. You know, I just started really enjoying it. You know, even though like I could I could have made more money just doing banking consulting, I just you know, I just had, like you say, like when I, when I worked, I worked for Barclays Capital, BZW then, and like there were thousands of people in that office, you know, and I was in one sub department of a sub department of a sub department working on one system, you know, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's such a huge, it's tough to feel like you're having much of an impact on anything, you know, but people stay because of the money um, and, and, it, and it's kind of golden handcuffs in some ways, you know? Yeah, it's true. It's very, very true. So you, you spent a long time in Hong Kong, which is one of my favorite places in the world. Like how you said you moved around a couple of times. How did you how did you enjoy Hong Kong? And what, what's it like, like, as you know, as a working for a school in Hong Kong? Would, would you recommend it? Yeah, it's it's a fantastic city. I, I have nothing but good things to say about Hong Kong and certainly Hong Kong as it was when I was living there. Um, what most people don't realize is the outdoors. You know, yeah. you spend your life outdoors. I, I did a lot of trail running played a lot of rugby, gaily football, soccer, but you're out on the trails all the time, running through hills. I think it's about, I'm not sure if it's correct, but about 60% of Hong Kong is, is country park. It's, yeah. it's wild and it's out there. There's beaches, there's remote areas. People just think city. They yeah. have no idea that the vast majority of time you spend in the outdoors and in the wilderness. I used to run home from one of our campuses uh, every week where on, and this is like on Hong Kong Island to another spot on Hong Kong Island. And I would run across porcupines. I remember like you could run kind of down forest. through the forest, couldn't you? I, I was there, you, like you know, the school was on the top of the hill and you lived at the bottom more or less, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. actually from the, from the Pok Phulang campus, which is at the far end of the, of the island, it was, it's a, well, depending on how fit and fibers I'm feeling, that's a longer run, but uh, yeah. it, it's a really good one, a really nice one. But I think that's, 
That's quite Kinds surprising of. what you're saying, Declan, about the perception that Hong Kong is high rises, very congested urban environment and, and then having that flip side of, and I think that's so often the case when as an international school teacher or educator, you go to these countries and suddenly you discover a side that nobody knows about, you know, uh, there's always that gem, that little something that people, you know, make these assumptions, fair enough or just generalizations. And then when you live there, you're like, oh my goodness me, I had no idea this was happening here. And that's mm. a great example of it. Yeah. I'm curious, Declan, what you think of, because I, I always, you know, we, we thought about living in Hong Kong and I, it always seems to me to have had a great, you know, especially speaking specifically, like from my point of view as, as an expat there, there's a great expat scene in terms of sports, sport and social, like, and how can you describe that? And, and has it changed a lot? Is, is it, is that, is that going away? Is it, is it becoming less foreigners there? You've obviously seen a lot of changes in 16 years or whatever. Like, how would you describe the expat scene? Is it, is it a great place still socially and sport wise? And, and is it changing? It is, it is, but the demographics will slightly change. Um, it is an ex a very expensive place to stay. Um, yeah. And what you're seeing is that like people who work in, let's say, law, they're not going to stay, um, given the regulations that are coming in, uh, yeah. in in the courts at the moment. And you know, expat lawyers, I'm not sure, are willing to preach the Communist Party line. So you can imagine that there, they, there's. Well, I know there is an exodus of, of them too. Uh, teachers are now being presented with um, what they need to teach. So the national security law needs to be taught. So you now have to be a, a mouthpiece for that also, despite the fact you probably don't, you disagree with it. And Declan, is that also for international schools then? Well, this, so this I'm an international area, school teacher right? and then I have area. to say that again? This is a gray area at the moment. It's not being enforced. It is expected, uh, like the national anthem now has to be taught. There's a whole bunch of things slowly. Well, not slowly. They're actually coming in quite quickly. It's happening. It's happened extremely fast. If you told me two or three years ago that I would be talking about Hong Kong in this manner, I would have laughed at you. I said, there's no way that that could happen to an open, free, and fair city in such yeah. a short space of time. We all kind of knew that uh, after the 50-year um one country, two systems, that it would happen. But it, I don't know whether it was COVID or what else, but the fact that it's been pushed through uh, forcefully at such a rate, it has certainly changed the feeling of the city. Um, but look, people are still going to earn tons of money there. Bankers are going to go earn lots and lots of money. And that will always attract expats. You know, especially with the role. Then, so especially with the role of China as an economic power, a global power, there's there's no way you can ignore it. And I think, as you're sure. saying, bankers and finance people, traders, commerce, it's still, it's non-negotiable. You need to have a presence in that city, very likely. Uh, look, bankers, nurses, engineers go to Saudi Arabia and earn tons of money. Yeah. If you yeah. go to Saudi Arabia, you go anywhere, you know? So, I mean, so. Inter international school teachers as well. I, I know plenty yeah. of people working in schools yeah. in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So Declan, then you're in Hong Kong and you decide to go to East Africa to Tanzania, which is very likely. We went from Tanzania to China. We moved from Dar es Salaam to Beijing. So it was a bit of a different, you know, it was far more, uh, it felt like we were going to a very developed environment compared to 93 where Tanzania was. Just curious, why did you pick Tanzania or was that this more the job than the geography? I'd like to say it was very strategic, but it wasn't. Okay. Um, so I, I sort of, I interviewed with a number of schools in the region, very similar Asian large cities, you know, like Singapore and uh, Seoul. And, and it would have been a like for a like, it would have been a very, very similar job for me, moving from a big Asian international school in a major city uh, into another one. And, and then my, uh, my wife and I had a discussion about, you know, it's, it's sort of at, at this time, should we go for something a little bit more adventurous? Should we try something that, that's not, you know, uh, an exact replica of what we've kind of been doing for the last 15 years? And we just thought with the age of our family and our kids and everything else, that this was an opportunity to sort of cast the net a little bit wider. And I think it came about on just one Friday 
one Friday evening, I, I looked at, at uh, Search Associates and, and decided to open up the search fields, widen open the filter, and then that propped up um, a couple of different locations, this being one of them. And I, I applied without much thought. It wasn't very strategic. It was just like, yeah, that could be an option. I've been through Africa before. So in between, I think one of my uh, contracts, IT contracts and starting somewhere else, I would actually spent several months traveling throughout Africa. And I had been to Zanzibar and I knew, you know, and I'd climbed Kilimanjaro. So I knew, I knew parts of Tanzania before I had come. Um, and then I just fired off a few CVs and then a whole bunch of interviews cropped up. Uh, offers came in. And then actually, to be honest, it was really my wife pushing it. She really liked the idea of moving here. She had connected with her, which would have been her vice principal when we came. And, uh, and yeah, we just, it just seemed to make sense for us as a family at that time. Right. And it was the right move at the right time. And we, actually, we really haven't regretted it since it's the first year has been really, really good here. Cool. So this is, you just finished your first year uh, in DAR. Yeah. yeah. Great. So John, I think what would be good at this point is like, why don't you tell us a bit about what it was like when you were there? What was the school like? What was Dar es Salaam? And then, you know, we can, we can get Declan's opinion on, on there. Like, so first of all, like just living, like what was it like, like living there when you were there? So when we came to Tanzania in 93, uh, there were not a lot of infrastructure. For example, uh, we were encouraged to bring in toilet paper and, and some of these Western necessities. So we got a shipment actually. And when we got there, we had a lot of issues with power. So there was actually a big generator that we had that uh, generated power during the day for the lower school and there was one in the upper school and then at night for a couple hours it ran to keep the ac and the hot water going and the refrigerators going in the houses so it was definitely a country that was fully you know a developing nation it had just come out of uh, it had its first few elections uh, there was not much crime. It was very safe. Uh, the, you know, everything was potholed. I had, we had a Land Rover. Uh, everything was complicated. You know, if you got sick, you flew to Johannesburg or Nairobi. Uh, there was the hospital Mumbuli, uh, Mumbuli, oh, I forget its name. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. Say that again. Yeah. So I did have the pleasure of going there a couple times, which was quite frightening. And my wife actually spent time at Mikicheni Hospital, which was also quite frightening. Uh, it was, you know, it was a real adventure. You really felt that you were, you know, in a developing country. Uh, things just didn't work. There was a lot of corruption. On the weeks when it was payday for police uh, men, if you were parked at a red light, you were given a ticket for illegally parking. <laughs> Things like that, you know, there, the, the, the road was not paved outside of parts of uh, Dar es Salaam. So if you wanted to go north to town Bagamoya, that was all dirt track. And then there was a road that went halfway out of Dar, but then some parts were not. Uh, traffic was really dangerous. A lot of just people that, you know, were driving with cars that shouldn't be on the road. So that, the school was amazing. Uh, at that time, the uh, director was Bill Powell, who unfortunately passed away. And he was definitely, you know, the pedagogy, the professional development we got there was phenomenal. So I would say as professionals, we really, really grew. And there were a lot of opportunities and the school culture was really one of, you know, uh, lifelong learning and kind of very open. And the school was big, it was 1400 at that time. And it had been around since 63. Uh, so yeah, very, you know, it was our first adventure and it really felt like adventure. Every time we went out, when you went shopping, you had to go to five, six different places because nothing really, you know, you heard, oh, there is cereal or muesli in this store and everybody would drive out and then, you know, things like that. So that's just a quick snapshot. Yeah. There are certain things have not changed. So I think the idea that, I mean, the stores are, are, are big multinationals now, but there is still that thing of there's a, we, we're on WhatsApp groups where someone can come on and say, oh my God, there's something in this store and people flock and buy it all up because it could disappear and never appear again. 
Um, but for most things, there's there's very little you you can't get here. Um, the 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 thing about the police that hasn't changed a little bit. There, <laughs> I think they're some of the most corrupt, um, and you can regularly just get pulled over for a chat, and that chat can be very quick or very slow depending on what you give them. Um, so, and I think it is related to payday. Um, so yeah, that, that and then the, the paved roads. Some of the roads are, are definitely not paid, and having a four wheel drive is 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 useful. But the, the, there are major major projects here, uh, like big roads and highways. Now, of course, it has got upgraded. But what about the IT infrastructure for you, John? When you were here, yeah. What did you see? What's the, so when, when I got the there, there was no internet, and there was one phone that you had to go to the main office, and you made appointments, and then once a week you could call home. And then uh, JJ and myself worked out a, a phone line from the main administrative building in the lower school to the computer lab that was plugged into an IBM. And that was very intermittent. But what we used to do is people would line up and type their emails. We'd save it to a floppy disk. And then we would drive up to the University of Dar es Salaam because they had a good internet connection. And then we would send the emails out. And then the week later, we would go and get the emails and then people could read them. So that was really at the beginning. There really, during my tenure, the internet was just starting and it was very expensive. We were a Mac school, believe it or not. There was a good Mac dealer in those days. Uh, most, you know, nobody had computers in the classroom. We used to do our report cards in PageMaker, if anybody remembers PageMaker. Uh, you know, it was just, it was definitely, everything was done on, a, on the computer. There was, no, you know, uh, we had maybe a network amongst the computers in the lab, but nothing more. So I would say IT wise, it was very, very rudimentary. But I know f once the cell phones start coming in after I left, things really shifted quite quickly because mobile technology kind of jump started. I think in Africa, many countries said, okay, we don't have phone lines, but we have the mobile networks and, you know, microfinancing loans, that whole uh, dynamic is very, very well developed in Africa and I'm sure yeah. the internet now. But I remember, you know, we, we had this one line and people lining up on the floppy disk, you know, writing their emails. It's just, yeah, everything was very, very, very slow. Mail is unreliable. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, everything took it forever and somehow nobody was stressed or did, maybe did you have were, a local area network john did you have a, a do you have any kind of lan or anything in the school or? we just had connected the apple computers and the labs together that was right. it that was it apple talk but Great. nothing elaborate no nothing that you know it was hard to get parts and uh, we pretty much all the computer classes was a lot of desktop publishing uh we you know used this thing called kidpix uh, which was great. It was a great little multimedia hypercard. We used hypercard a lot. So, and kids came into the lab and artwork and then uh, letters and stuff like that, bit of desktop publishing. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was a different time. But now, Declan, tell us. Yeah, can I, can I just jump in before Declan? Because I was, I've been to the school in between both your t 10 years. We ran a Google Summit there, which was it seven years ago. I'm not sure exactly, but something like that. And that was when Santa Kumar was Kumar was the tech director. And um, they were really getting going with Google then. They had a we had a they had two classes, a pilot project of Chromebooks. They were starting to run the first Chromebooks. Obviously, that's why they ran the Google Summit because they were they wanted to train the teachers. So I think, you know, seven or eight, I don't know, was was Santa the person before you or was somebody else before that, uh, Declan? No, so since then, there's a, a guy called David Hunt, who yep. is just starting up in Thailand at the moment, I think. And David was here for, he only did a two-year spell. Yeah, great. So so, how, so, what, so De tell us, Declan, what's, uh, how's it going now? What, what, what's the situation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more like a, a proper international school now. Um, it, it's bring your own device in the, in the entire secondary section. And then from grade three, four, five, it's one to one with Chromebooks. And then in the, uh, the early years, we're hoping, well, we're just moving towards going one to one with iPads. Uh, all teachers have MacBooks. Uh, the network is okay, not very reliable or, or widespread, I would say. And that's why the Cisco order, which is imminent, 
will uh, will push us forward and, and keep us robust and and um, a reliable network that should you know last five ten years. Uh, and that's been the problem. I think um, David, who was here before me, did a great job, but um, in in his two year spell, he never really got a chance. And of course, one of those years was uh, COVID interrupted. He never really got a chance to tackle some of these big projects while he was here. Um, so a year before that, they had no tech director. I think the, the tech director they'd hired fell through where there were visa issues, which was a, a big problem um, oh. during the, the last president's uh, tenure. He was really clamping down on foreigners getting visas. So uh, that, that became a big problem. And, and a lot of the old school uh, employees, guys who were, and girls who were here for many, many years, their visas dried up. They put like, a, I think, a five or six year limit so if you've been here too long, they all got cleaned out. So we don't, we have very, very few teachers who have been here uh, a long period of time. Um, so John, there would be literally nobody who worked from your time through to here. But in terms of yeah, technology- Yeah, because that's sorry, interesting, Declan, with that visa thing, because I know when we were there, there people had been there 10 years and some people stayed there 20, 30 years because they really love the school. It's a, it's a wonderful school. And Dar es Salaam is a lovely city if you're willing to kind of juggle the, 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 the challenges, but the, the setting and the people is quite amazing. So that's interesting. So these visas basically are controlling the tenure of how long people can stay. Well, not any, so there's been a change. The, the last president passed away last or this year and of, well, reasonably recently, and they've brought in a new president and she seems to be quite uh, more forward thinking. Um, so she's had a number of initiatives to say, look, we need, we need foreigners in to help push the economy and everything else forward. And she's also done another thing like reducing the VAT on mobile devices. So now our iPads and phones, uh, again, like what you mentioned earlier, John, about getting the, the, the general populace connected to the internet to, to drive the economy forward. And um, they've got a very low percentage here. I, th I think it's in the tune of 40, 50% of, uh, of the population is connected to the internet, which is extremely low. So they want to push that up much, much higher. And by reducing or removing the VAT on mobile devices, they're hoping that they can get that number up drastically. So Declan, talk to us a bit about the uh, technicians, you know, so you are the IT director, you have some digital learning coaches, you have librarians, but you also have an IT support group. Talk a bit about Tanzania and technology and kind of the skill set. Are you being able to tap into that locally? Uh, is there, you know, between the different schools, is there kind of like IT groups? What is that like, that whole kind of professional well, learning? So the first year we, I, we have done nothing because it's been COVID. Our campus has been, you know, we don't even have, we haven't had parents on our campus. So I can't invite wow. anyone external yet at all. Wow. So I'm waiting for that network to, to sort of kick off and, and certainly host. Now I would say in Tanzania, we are most definitely the, the most well-funded and equipped school by, I would say by quite a long shot. So one of the problems I'm having here, and again, this is sort of because of my mentality where I've come from and then coming from Hong Kong, which is right on the on the door of China, the ability to order um, equipment and the turnaround, as you know yourself, the turnaround, if I think of something in Hong Kong on Tuesday, it's implemented on Wednesday, having been purchased the night before and delivered, like everything happens so quickly. And the staff, my, my IT department in Hong Kong was, was fantastic. I had some really, really uh, great uh, team members working for me and with me in, in Hong Kong. Here, it is definitely more of a struggle. And that, I think to change the perception, you can sort of rest on your laurels here and say, well, we're the best school in Tanzania. I, I'm not saying that it's bad, but there's not very much competition there in terms of other major international schools with budgets like we have. So we need to be comparing ourselves to global institutions, major schools around the world. And that's our benchmark, not sort of looking locally to say, hey, I'm a big fish in a small pond. Because we're, we are an, a major international school on the circuit and we, you know, we, we get students coming from all other international schools all over the world. You know, as they come in here, a lot of their parents tend to work for NGOs, World Bank, 
a huge amount of diplomatic staff uh, come in with their kids as well. So we need to be on the cutting edge in a global context, not on a local context. So that has been a little bit of a, of a problem, getting a mind shift uh, and getting people to think bigger than what they see on the ground here. Interesting. Are, are the local Tanzanian schools, so you talked about this VAT being taken off for mobile phones and computers. W what have you noticed with the local population uh, and in schools, local schools? Is there much IT or is, is are you really just a whole ballpark away from what is local? Yeah, we're in a different world here. Uh, I mean, this this is like a, and you know, if you're walking around here in IST, you could be in any campus, almost anywhere in the world with the IT and the equipment and the facility. I mean, the facilities here are magnificent. Swimming pools to die for, that sports center that I mentioned that we're opening up is, is world-class. Some of the local schools here are, are, are sheds, sadly, very, very underfunded. Uh, I, I actually, I visited, a, a, I was on a run recently and I visited one, uh, school that we had dropped into and, uh, you know, sort of on the promise that we were trying to help this school out, but they're so far beyond the kind of help that we can offer. Um, students had ripped out the wall sockets to steal the, the little, you know, the wall sockets. Um, the fans had been taken away. Uh, it was just walls with cages instead of windows. And I don't know, like 70 or 80 chairs and tables in wow. one small room. I mean, that's what you're looking at. I mean, how do you bring technology into a, in, an environment like that? They're so far away from uh, being able to handle technology, keep technology, use it effectively. Yeah, it, 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 I don't know. It, it, it's not a hopeless task, but it seems a long way away from many schools. But there are tiers. There are private schools. So if you earn money here, you can pay for a better school. And some of the schools based on religious organizations are better funded. And, you know, they also have loads of really good uh, private schools here doing IB and everything else. So, yep. you know, there, there are bigger tiers. So if I take Hong Kong, for an example, any of the local schools are still very well equipped. Um, the lowest level of a local school here is, yeah, not, not it's as amazing. Nice. You said, I, know, I know in a lot of African countries, there's this trend of a lot of low-cost private schools, normally for-profit groups who set up a lot of these uh, ones. And, and some of them have really good education standards, you know, but it, it seems like a real, it's a trend in a lot of the developing world, but especially Africa, I think, these kind of, you know, lower tier private schools for, for parents, you know, for, for, you know, people who have kind of, not rich people, but people who have a kind of a, you know, basic to medium income. What's interesting, Declan, when you describe the local Tanzanian school, I had actually, uh, wor uh, we had a bunch of, you know, community projects with local schools. And you just described what I remember. That's amazing that, you know, 20 years later, we're still, they're still facing those challenges. That's interesting, Dan, what you're saying about, you know, that kind of middle class that is growing in Africa. There's a bigger middle class and they're also looking for a different type of education. And I think that's what a lot of these, because I know when we were in Tanzania, there was the International School of Tanganyika and then there was the Aga Khan had a school, but that was it. But I assume now you're, there are more schools than that, right, Declan? There are, yeah, there's some uh, Brayburn, which is a franchise school. So they've got a number of schools both here and in, um, in Kenya, um, International School of Moshi, which is now a United World College um, of, of, the, of that branding, and DIA, which is Dar es Salaam International Academy, I think, and Latham School, which is also a, a franchise. So a number, a number of, of, of players in the market now, and it, and it is changing, and I think, um, Tanzania is now a second world country. So it has progressed from being a third world country into second world country. So you are getting a burgeoning middle class. And as you get that, then people can spend money on, on education. Um, but those who are living hand to mouth, you know, they're not going to invest in education when they're just trying to earn enough money to get by. But as your middle class grows, then you have the income to be able to spend it on not, you know, a luxurious item like your child's education. Definitely. One thing I really liked about there was um, there was some great um, 
sort of bars and restaurants on the waterfront. We went to a beach and we went to a couple of local places just with the plastic chairs and stuff sat around, had a beer. And it was, it was like a really cool environment. All, you know, everyone, all the locals were all in the, playing in the beach. And it was, it was, a, it was a cool scene, you know. And then we went to another place that was kind of more market, like, you know, we've had a great terrace. Uh, but it was seemed like there was a lot of like really nice places to go to go out in the evening and weekends. I trust you to figure out the bars, Dan. Exactly, uh, that's the most important thing. The city related on the drinking establishments. We should call this podcast "Dan Talks About Bars All Around the World." Where he's <laughs> <laughs> global bar hop, global bar hop. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's what, what, what do you? It's called Coco Beach, and then the other place yeah. I think you were going was a place called Slipway. Yeah, these yeah, are Slipway. these are beautiful. Oh, the beautiful Slipway places. exists still. Yeah, that's that's really big now. It's a uh, very okay. Very, Is uh, Oyster Beach still a place to go? Uh, Oyster Beach? People, no, not Oyster Beach. Coco Beach is is the okay. Name. They must have changed the name. And then there was the uh, by the yacht club. There was a like a little mini supermarket mall there. Yeah. I, so right beside the school, you yeah, right beside the school, you've got Village Market, which is, is quite a big uh, supermarket. And then the big one is called Shoppers, and they've got a, a number of different stores scattered around the city. We but, all went to the Palm Beach Hotel because that was the only place you could get food uh, where generally you might not get sick and they had decent beer, Tuskers. <laughs> the Tuskers gone, right? That beer is gone. Now, oh, Tuskers uh, is gone. Okay. Yeah, it's gone. So it's all Tanzanian. So that you've got uh, Safari, Kilimanjaro, Serengeti. Um, but you know, there's all international beers here as well. And restaurants, you can you can choose to eat any type of restaurant you want. You can go to an Ethiopian, you can go to a uh, South African or, uh, you know, a Mexican wow. or anything at all. There's, there's great restaurants here now. We, uh, funny, uh, we, we were asking people, we were asking Tanzanian people, like, where do we go for Tanzanian food? And they were like, you want Ethiopian food? Like, what do you mean? Like, they, it didn't seem like they were that proud of their own cuisine. They were like, say, no, get Ethiopian food. That's the best one, you know? Well, when we were there, it was chicken and chips was kind of the standard plate yeah. we got. Or this thing called ugali, which is like a, a wheat maize bread with spinach. But there was a Turkish restaurant that we always used to go to. I don't know if it still exists. And of course, there was a large East Asian community uh, originally from India. So there were a lot of Indian restaurants that were actually quite decent. So it, it mm -hmm. sounds amazing to think that now there's such a wide culinary uh, options. You know, it, it's great to hear this, Declan, you know, after so many years that the school's still going, you know, the IT, it's just really, uh, such a positive thing to hear how a school over many decades and through very different, uh, you know, challenges and political contexts and everything, how the school is still thriving. That's really a, a nice uh, kind of anecdote to hear from having lived there so many years ago. I think it is. It, so the school has gone through some some difficult times. I think, um, as I mentioned, those uh, political times over the last sort of five, six years, has dropped a number of the the pair or the the families that are able to live in Dar. So our numbers dropped, uh, and COVID obviously took it made a, a hit as well. But we dropped quite a lot last year, and unsure of the numbers, there were some teachers put on sabbatical, and uh, you know there was downsizing and a bit of a halt on some of our spending programs. But uh, through the middle of last year. The confidence returned. Uh, people got posted back in again, uh, back into the country. And now, actually, we're looking with with the, the the new government and the ease on the visa regulations. We're sort of planning to open up. And actually, just this week, on one of our on our grade five level, we've had to open up a new uh, section. So instead of having three classes, we're now pushing to four. So it is actually looking very positive, looking forward uh, for IST and Tanzania as a whole. That's great. So Declan, you came from Hong Kong, which is, you know, a, a kind of, if you think of IT countries, it's very cutting edge. It's, you know, a lot of innovation. What was your kind of surprise when you came back, came into Tanzania? You know, th let's think, you know, I'm an IT person and I'm looking to come to Africa and every African country is very different. So we need to make sure people understand that. But what were some of the challenges and what were some of the pleasant surprises that you know, you're know you reflecting on after your first year? Um, I think just the expectations and um, 
yeah, the, I suppose the expectations and the standards that you would have in, in a major city like Hong Kong uh, that just aren't a given here. You expect that certain standards are followed, that all of the staff do A, B, C, D, that all of your equipment does A, B, C, D, and there are, and there are structures in place. And that's not always the case. So, uh, yeah, you can come in assuming certain things and then, and then find that they're, they're, not, they're not in place. Um, so that has, that has caused me to sort of reverse back and go right back down to the fundamentals to say, hold on, before I start progressing and developing and creating things here, let's make sure the fundamentals are in place before we progress forward. So that, that has taken a little bit of a hit um, and, and slowed me down, I would say, a little bit. And then, of course, just your, your access to um, equipment, like I mentioned, uh, the ordering process here is a little bit slower. Um, it's, it's hard to be any quicker than Hong Kong. And I think no matter where I went after Hong Kong, I would have suffered a little bit of that. But right being on the maybe door. Maybe Singapore I, or something might be the same. Like, well, I'm not even it. because I, I, would, I, I had a whole bunch of contacts with factories in, in Guangzhou and things like that, that yeah, you, know, yeah, that's true. you could ship things down and you know, a truck could get it over the border from China. Uh, you've got Taobao uh, and you can order things and get them delivered within a day or two. So yes. yeah, the, the ability to have all of those resources at your finger, fingertips and delivered you know, in minutes, that, that has been um, difficult to handle. But I, I, as I said, I, I probably would have suffered that no matter where I went in the world. Yep. Great. Well, look, Declan, I think that's a great, great place to leave it. That was a super interesting chat. And I, I really enjoyed hearing yours and John's comparison uh, there. So, um, look, great to talk. I hope we can do another talk. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm keen to hear where you uh, end up in the future. Or obviously, how long you stay there. And if you end up back to Asia, that, that'd be another future episode. But um, th thanks very much, Declan. Where can people find you online? Are, are you active on LinkedIn or Twitter? Or are you, you stay pretty quiet in that department? Uh, no, I am. I am. I'm not. I'm not too active on on Twitter. Um, I'm too busy. Yeah. <laughs> but you're on LinkedIn, and of course, we'll put the show notes about IST International School of Tanganyika. Declan, so wonderful to hear your stories and hear how some things are the same, but also so many rich new opportunities. And it sounds like the school's doing great. And good luck with this network upgrade. That sounds fantastic. I think that will definitely have a huge impact on what you're very likely trying to do on the pedagogic side, you know, getting people to uh, really engage with digital fluency. So wonderful, wonderful to hear your anecdotes. And uh, yeah, just sending a big hug to Tanzania from uh, Luxembourg. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks, Dan.